Hello and welcome to the Continuous Delivery Foundation presentation on Google Summer of Code 2021. My name is Martin Danjou, and in this presentation, the students will present the work that they did during Google Summer of Code 2021, combining phase one and phase two of their work. And this presentation is actually a montage of part one and part two, which took place on two different uh, days, and we're combining the two into a single presentation for this recording. Today, we're going to be talking about the uh, projects our student worked on. But first, we're going to have an introdu introduction to the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Then our students are going to present their work. This will be followed by question and answers. Links to the phase one demo slides and phase two demo slides are provided here. I would like to invite Tara to present the Continuous Delivery Foundation. So uh, Continuous Delivery Foundation uh, was founded by uh, Google, Netflix, uh, and CloudBees uh, back in 20, I want to say 2018, 2019. Uh, it's a little early in the morning for me, sorry. I <clears throat> don't remember the exact dates. Um, but the purpose is it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sub-organization of the Linux Foundation um, with the purposes of furthering the development tool stack as it relates to, in particular, to continuous delivery uh, and helping drive industry standards. Um, we became a sponsor for Google Summer of Code last year for the first time. Um, and uh, Jenkins, it has a long standing, the Jenkins project has a long standing uh, history with Google Summer of Code. So the foundation uh, joined in along as well. And we've had uh, uh, students also contribute to their projects. So it continues to be an area where we love to see investment. Next slide. Martin, next slide. So it's our second year, as I said, we had 22 project proposals. Uh, we were able to accept six projects this year. Um, we had uh, three to four mentors per project. It's really great. The, the various projects get really excited to support the students in their efforts. Uh, this year, we had uh, good project proposals for Jenkins and Spinnaker. Um, additional projects uh, that can be considered would include uh, Jenkins X, uh, Tecton, and Screwdriver, uh, as well as Ortelius. And then next year, uh, we will have another new project that will be online for students to take a look at, um, which is Shipwright. So we're expanding the number of projects uh, that are available. And so hopefully you can spread the word amongst your friends. They want to apply for student uh, proposals next year. We will hopefully have a plethora of opportunities. Um, I am pleased to report all the students passed their midterm evaluations. I haven't seen the latest results yet for the final, but uh, it has been a very successful summer of code season. Next slide. Yes, so I want to ex extend a thank you um, to our students and mentors. Um, I also want to extend an invitation. Um, hopefully all of you are made aware that you have the ability to record a lightning talk. Uh, could be a talk that you recorded for this. Um, it could be a, another variation to submit to DevOps World. We have reserved time there. Um, so you could have a chance to see your project um, uh, at an industry event, which we hope that you will choose to join. Um, as a reminder, we have a very firm code of conduct and I hope that your experience as a student with one of the Continuous Delivery Foundation projects was a positive one. So thanks again. Back to you, Martin. Thank you, Tara. Before we get started with the presentations, I would like to invite mentors or org admins to say a few words. Yeah, I would say a few things, if you don't mind. Of course. So, yeah, first of all, thanks to all uh, six students working on the Continuous Delivery Foundation GSOC projects, and thanks to everyone who was uh, working on Jenkins. 
Uh, we had uh, five uh, great projects. Uh, four of them are focused on Jenkins in the cloud and on cloud deployments. And even if you uh, take a look at these presentations, so cloud events, uh, remote monitoring with open telemetry and parameters and um, uh, security detectors for Jenkins Kubernetes separator, all of them are strengthen uh, Jenkins position uh, in cloud environments. And this is exactly what we need for the project. And uh, all of uh, these projects are an important part of the Jenkins roadmap. So thanks a lot to mentors, students, and we are looking forward to uh, seeing this project uh, adopted uh, by Jenkins and users. Thank you, Oleg. Two organizations participated as part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation in the Google Summer of Code this year the Jenkins organization. You can find the Jenkins organization uh, Google Summer of Code channels uh, from their main page on Jenkins.io. They also use a Gitter chat. You can also find them on specific channels of the CDF Slack. They also use a discourse uh, site on community.jenkins.io and there's the mailing list. The second organization that participated under the umbrella of the CDF is Spinnaker. You can find Spinnaker at spinnaker.io, and you can also find them in the Slack workspace, Slack workspace spinnakerteam.slack.com under the GSOC-2021 channel. The First three demos are going to be Git credentials binding for SHPath and PowerShell. This will be followed by conventional commits plugin for Jenkins. And lastly, try.spinnaker.io. In the second part of the demo by our students, there will be three presentations, Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins, Security Validator for Jenkins Kubernetes Operator, and Jenkins Remote Monitoring. Git Credentials Binding for SH, BAT, and PowerShell. Today, I'm going to talk you through my presentation for Git Credentials Binding and we'll discuss the results that me and the mentors have achieved so far, so far during the GSHRC 2021 program. So let's get started. So under the project overview, the project involves extending the credentials binding plugin to create custom bindings for two types of credentials which are username, password, and as such private key. These bindings are then used to automate the authentication task when performing any Git operation using command line Git through such bat or PowerShell in a pipeline job. Now, why these bindings were required or what was the motivation behind them? Firstly, when it comes on performing a Git operation using a pipeline script, there is not much support provided. And the user had to depend on various workarounds to the credentials binding plugin or environment directive. So the solution was to use with credentials wrapper provided by credentials binding plugin, which would take the user's credential and supply them automatically when a Git operations ask for them during a user's authentication. Coming to the objectives of the project. So the first objective was to provide Git authentication support for HTTPS protocol and SSH protocol. Then comes the targeted audience, which were pipeline job users. Another requirement was that the binding should support command line Git version 1.8.3 and later. Also, 
it should be well it sh should be available on different operating systems the last one was that it should support not only a jenkins controller but also a jenkins agent now the results for phase 1 so during this phase, we were able to achieve Git authentication support for HTTPS protocol. And it was released as Git username password binding in Git plugin version 4.8.0. Also, these uh, this binding support uh, supported both freestyle project and pipeline jobs. The results for phase two in this phase we were able to achieve git authentication support for ssh protocol and the support for private key formats include uh, open ssh pem and pkcs8 also uh, four encryption algorithms were supported namely rsa dsa ecdsa and ed25519 The support for pri private key formats and encryption algorithms are provided through the Bouncy Castle API plugin and SSHD plugin. This binding was also available for both freestyle projects and pipeline jobs. Now I'm going to showcase the demo. In the demo, I am going to showcase both the bindings. First, I am going to show the working of Git username and password binding in a freestyle project. So now we'll look in the configurations of this project. Uh, here I'm performing a simple Git checkout on a remote repository hosted on GitLab, which is a private repository. So as you can see, this is the repository that I'm using to perform the Git checkout. Now I'm using the Git user and password credentials to push a tag to the remote repository. So now we will build the project. So as we can see, the project was built successfully. And if we see here, there are three tags and now there are four. So the tag was successfully pushed. Now I will be showcasing the git ssh private key binding. So I'm using a pipeline job for this. If we look at the configurations, I am using an agent, which is an Ubuntu machine to, to use this binding. So here I'm performing a simple git clone operation on a repository, which is hosted on GitHub. And this repository also is also a private repository.
so we will be building the job now as you can see the build is being performed for different private keys which are using formats such as OpenSSH, PKCS8 and and all these keys are encrypted with passphrase. So the build was successful and this shows that we were able to successfully clone the repository using private key binding. So this was the demo. So now moving on to the road head. So here the, we will be discussing the tasks that need some work even after the G-Shock program. So that includes adding more automated unit tests and making minor bug fixes and code improvements. But apart from all that, the major task is of releasing the git SSH private key binding. And that's all for the presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions on uh, the, this project for for Harshit who is online right now with us? We have a comment from Rishab just pointing out it was not possible to do get authenticated operations before this. So securing uh, pipeline efforts is super important. This is, this is very awesome. Great. I look forward to actually using this in my own uh, in my own build files. That sounds uh, really useful. All right, thank you very much, uh, Harshit. We're going to move on to the next presenter. Next presentation is conventional commits plugin for Jenkins by Aditya Srivastava. Mm, Aditya, are you online here? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, so uh, do you want to share share your screen, share your presentation, and go at your own pace? Uh, okay, so I my presentation is a mixture of both PPT and a video, but I would like you to keep sharing because Zoom behaves weirdly on my system when I share the screen. Okay, so you you want me to change slide when you tell me? Yes, that would be really helpful. Okay, um, the floor is yours then. And just let me know when to switch to the next slide. Sure. So uh, I'll start with the conventional comments plugin for Jenkins. Before starting, I would like to thank my mentors. I was lucky to have such an awesome mentoring team, Garrett, Kristen, Olivia, and Alan. Thank you so much for mentoring me throughout the phase of GSOC. Uh, next slide, please. So this is me, I'm Aditya. I'm a GSOC student over here. I'm a Jenkins infrastructure enthusiast and I like open source in general. You can move to the next slide, please. So uh, today I'll be talking about what are conventional commits, conventional plugins for a plugin for Jenkins, how to use the plugin. I'll show you our demo, extending the plugin and next steps, followed by Q and A if there's any. We can. Uh, okay. So what are conventional commits? Conventional commits. Uh, so uh, Martin, there would be some kind of an animation here in place. So if it be, it will be better if you can just bring out the whole slide. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you so much. 
So conventional commits are a lightweight conventional uh, convention on top of our commit messages. They are made such that so that it is easier. Uh, the commits are human readable and it is easy to write automation tool. Uh, conventional commits dovetail with semantic versioning. So uh, can we move to the next slide? There are some examples of conventional commits. Uh, a chore is used to, uh, so conventional, as, as I was talking about conventional commits, uh, they are, they dovetail with semantic versioning. So they, are, they follow this pattern of ma uh, major, minor, and patch, ver patch versions. So a chore is a conventional commit, which basically says not to bump any version of all the three versions. Fix is incrementing the patch version. Feet is a f addition of feature. It increments the minor version and breaking chains in increments the major version. Uh, of the semantic versions. So there are multiple ways to write a breaking change that's been uh, shown over here on this slide. We can move to the next slide. So now I'll be talking about what's the what's this plugin, what does this plugin do in Jenkins environment? Uh, Martin, you can bring in the whole slide again. Yes, thank you. So. Right, so this plugin determines the next semantic version. It takes in the following things, the get commit log of a repository, the latest tag, and the current semantic version that it is at. So sometimes the, the latest tag and the current version mentioned in the configuration file would be different. The plugin handles those situations as well. Currently, we support six project types, that is Maven, Help, Gradle, Python, Make, and NPM. Uh, we are adding more uh, project types. and in, and you'll see how you how easy it is to add a project type in upcoming slides. We can go to the next slide. So, using the plugin, plugin is available at uh, plugins.jenkins.io. Such conventional commits. You can also download it from the update center. Uh, we are using Jep229 to release the plugin on every feature. A recommended usage, and you'll see this in demo, is adding a step in the Jenkins pipeline. So, and it works on both uh, declarative and scripted pipelines. We can go to the next slide, a demo. Welcome to the demo of conventional comments plugin for Jenkins. Here we'll be looking at five major use cases, starting with minor version bump, followed by a major version bump, then using build metadata, bumping with pre-release, and write back the calculated version. Let's get started. Okay, so let's see how a um, minor version bump looks like. So I have a sample Maven project. I'll show you all the source code. It's on GitHub. And as well, you can see there's just one tag at 0.1.0. And I recently pushed a commit adding a feature that is add hello world action. I have a sample pipeline ready. I'll show that. Configure. And here's the pipeline. We are cloning the project and calling the next version. So save it and build. So as it was, as the tag was 0 0.1.0 and we had made a feature commit, adding a feature. So it will bump the minor version and it should ideally show 0 0.2.0. Now let's see whether it does that. I see the next version. So it's, it correctly identified the tag and the next version. So now let's try bumping the major version. I have a sample repository ready here with me. It's a sample Python repository. As you all can see, there are no tags present and I have made a breaking change comment. I will show you all the current version of the project. It's usually in a setup.py or config file. I have it in the config file. Let me open it. And the version is 0.0.0. .0 .0. Uh, so now let's go back, create a pipeline and bump the version. So it's a new item. I'll have to give it a name, sample Python project, pipeline, okay. just the script. So we are just cloning the project and calling the next version. Apply, save, and I'll build it now. So what we are trying to see over here is as the current version is 0.0.0, .0, 0 .0 and the commit is a breaking change, it should bump the major version and give the next version as 1.0.0. Let's see the logs. So the next version, it says no tags found. So as there were no tags and 1.0.0. .0. So 
So we saw a minor version bump on the sample Maven project, a major version bump on the Python project. Now let's go back to the Maven project and see how we can use me build metadata in the conventional commits plugin. So here we are back at the sample Maven project pipeline and I have modified the pipeline a bit to add build metadata to the conventional commits plugin. I'll show you all the pipeline here. I have used environment variables to add build numbers using the optional parameter build metadata. The rest of the steps remain same. I am finally printing the next version. So let's run it. As it's getting built, uh, if you'll remember, this is the same uh, project that I used to demonstrate the minor version bump. So we know that the next version should be 0 0.2.0 along with the build number. So yeah, so here's the print message and it is 0 0.2.0 along with the build number 6. Let's see another interesting feature of the conventional commits plugin that is adding pre-release information. We'll have to modify the pipeline script a bit. I'll be adding the optional parameter pre-release and name it alpha. Apply and save. Now uh, let's build the plugin. Okay, it's built. So the plugin calculated the next semantic version and appended the pre-release information we gave it. What I recommend you all is to go to the GitHub repository of the conventional commits plugin and look at all the options that are available to manipulate the pre-release feature. So we have three, that is pre-release, naming the pre-release. Second is preserve pre-release, that is keep the existing pre-release, the default value is false. And finally, we have increment pre-release where we increment the pre-release option and the default is false, so last two are Boolean. Uh, I won't demo these in the interest of time, but uh, we can see how it will work using this table, thanks to Philip. Uh, so if our current version is 0.1.0 alpha and we have a fix that is incrementing the patch version, we have preserved pre-release and increment pre-release, then our final version would be 0.1.0, 0 .1 uh, 0.1.1. This is because of the patch version alpha because we have preserved the pre-release and dot one because we have incremented the pre-release. So the final feature for today's demo is the write version feature. The user, a user can use this feature to write back the calculated semantic version into the configuration file of the project. It, uh, uh, adding a write version optional parameter as true would do the job. So I'll apply and save and build now. Hmm. It takes a couple of seconds to build. It's done. I'll see the logs. And it says that the next version was written to the configuration file. It would be interesting to go and check where has this been written. So I have already uh, changed my directory to the project and I will just form the text So here's the version that's been written. Uh, I think we can go back to the slides. Uh, there are a couple of them. So extending the plugin, uh, as you, you all can see, we had only six project types that we supported. Suppose you want to add a new one that is, uh, let's take an example of Go project type. You just have to create a public class and implement the following three methods. That is check. The check method just uh, is, is a, it returns a Boolean true or false. It's a check whether the project is at, the given repository is of that particular project type. So we usually check for the configuration file. For example, if it's a Maven project, we'll check whether the pom.xml exists or not in the given directory. Uh, second is the get current version. It is reading the current version from the configuration file of the project. And finally is write version, so uh, write, writing back the calculated version to the file. 
And thanks to Kristen, this was super easy. <laughs> she, she, she suggested the factory pattern for this. So yeah. thank you so much. And oh, don't forget to add your class to the project, uh, project type factory. on next steps uh, so yes so next steps would be to uh, write back uh, in various configuration files so right now maven and npm are done gradle python helm and make are left so that that would be my next steps and uh, we would love to hear your feedbacks and suggestions for the plugin uh, on github and also on Gitter. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Aditya on his work? No questions in channel, though this is very cool. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Aditya, for your work on the conventional commits plugin. And thank you to the mentors as well. Let's move on to the next presentation. Try.spinnaker.io by Danielle Co. This is also a recording. Hi, my name is Daniel, and today I'll be presenting my Google Summer of Code 2021 project try.spinnaker.io, explore Spinnaker in a sandbox environment. I'd like to start off my presentation giving a little um, primer on what Spinnaker is. So Spinnaker describes itself on its website as an open source multi-cloud continuous delivery platform that helps you release software changes with high velocity and confidence. As you can tell, it is quite a mouthful and I like to break um, down these buzzwords one by one. A simplified high-level explanation of what Spinnaker is, is a tool that allows you to deploy applications in a very fast and safe way. Spinnaker supports deployments on all major cloud providers such as AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Provider, and Oracle. Spinnaker's biggest selling point is its continuous delivery features. It supports advanced deployment strategies such as red-black rollouts, which deploy a new version of your application with the existing version, and it destroys the old version once the new version is ready to go. It also supports automated canary analysis, which rolls out a change to an application to a small subset of users, and then metrics are collected to see if everything is running properly. You can also define your own deployment process to your heart's content. Spinnaker also supports rollbacks, which allows you to revert to an older version of an application if the new version has gone catastrophically wrong. There's also a manual judgment feature, which makes all updates require human approval. And you can restrict updates to a certain time period. There are tons of other features that are available in Spinnaker, and I recommend you to read them if you're interested on our website. Spinnaker was originally developed by Netflix to serve as their own private deployment platform, but it was released to the public in 2015. And since then, Many other companies, such as Google and Airbnb, have also adopted it as their own primary deployment platform. And in 2019, Spinnaker was donated to the CD Foundation. The motivation for this project actually comes from my personal experience. I clearly remember the first time when I tried to install Spinnaker, and it was extremely difficult to say the least. And I spent countless hours searching through random GitHub issues and looking through Stack Overflow and digging up random messages from Slack just to get the main UI of Spinnaker to appear on my computer. And I think probably one of the biggest reasons why it's so difficult is because there's so many dependencies required to actually get Spinnaker running. So you need a external storage provider like an S3 bucket, you need to have a Kubernetes cluster that has at least 16 gigs of RAM and four cores. You also need to set up cloud providers that you want to deploy to and you need to do a lot of networking to expose um, the UI, the API, and what, whatever services you're providing. 
if you compare this to like a project like Jenkins, all you need to do to run Jenkins on your computer is to have Java installed and double click the jar file. Having a sandbox environment where users can go in and deploy some pipelines and test out the Spinnaker UI is something that I really wish I had when I first heard about this project. I think other open source projects saw the importance of lowering the barrier to entry to having some kind of hands-on experience with their own project, which is why we see services like the Go Playground and Play with Docker being available to the public. Regarding the infrastructure of our project, I decided to go with a multi-tenant solution on an AWS EKS cluster. This means that all the users will be sharing a, a single Spinnaker instance on the cloud. All the infrastructure is codified using Terraform, and it is simple as running one command to get try.spinnaker.io running on AWS. Spinnaker and its associated configurations are installed using Armory's open source Spinnaker operator. So here are some of the key features relating to environment from our project. We mainly decided to focus on supporting Kubernetes deployments, as the most common use case for Spinnaker is to deploy to a Kubernetes cluster. We support the AWS load balance controllers so that users have an easy way of accessing their deployments on their web browser. We also have a private image registry hosted on AWS so that we can get around any rate limiting issues and also so that we can verify the authenticity of each image that we allow users to deploy. We have also installed a special admissions controller to block any images that are not from our private registry. For user deployments, we have a couple of default pipelines that users can deploy. We also have an auto resource cleanup pipeline that deletes any unused resources after a certain period of time. So here's a demo of the Highlander pipeline where we deploy version one and version two of a certain application. So after you hit the manual execution button, you can see Spinnaker um, going through its various stages for this pipeline. So after everything needed for version one is deployed, here is a manual judgment stage, which directs users to go to the load balancer section and take a look at the Deployment using the URL. So after a few moments, you can see version one of the application being deployed. And then the user can go back to the Spinnaker UI and continue to the next stage where we deploy version two of this application. Once it's finished deploying, the user can go back to the same URL and refresh the page and you will be able to see version 2 of the application being deployed. And then the user can confirm that they did indeed see version 2 and that concludes the um, pipeline. So here's a quick demo of the cleanup pipeline. So here's another um, pipeline that has stuff deployed to a cluster. And if we go back to this cleanup pipeline, this usually runs um, automatically every 30 minutes or so, but we can just run it manually for this example. And after a minute or so, we can go back to the pipeline that has stuff deployed to it. And if we refresh, we can see that um, everything is gone. Try.spinnaker.io also supports um, authentication and authorization. For authentication, we're using Google's OAuth 2.0. This allows anyone with a Google account to sign in and get started with Spinnaker right away. On the authorization side, I created a custom plugin for Spinnaker. This plugin extends the authorization server for Spinnaker, which is called Fiat and gives everyone a default role called public. The reason why we need to do this is because every application has a corresponding role and we need to give each user a specific role so that they can access the public pipelines and applications that we have predefined for them. The detailed auth flow for Spinnaker can be seen in the diagram below. So here's the auth flow from the user's perspective. 
So once they go to um, the try.spinnaker.io website, it redirects them to Google OAuth, and they can select which account they want to log in with. And after that, um, they are authenticated, so they can see um, the pipelines and applications that we have set up. If we query the API for more specific information about our account, we can see the roles listed here. So this account has the role public, and it also shows um, the email and the name that, that is associated with this particular account. So here are the areas for feature improvement. I think it would be nice if there are more default pipelines or more interesting containers to deploy, as there are only really three examples that we offer to users at this time. I originally planned for supporting user-created pipelines so that it would be a little more interactive, but due to time constraints and security concerns, we were unable to add this to our final project for the summer. However, the groundwork is already set for limiting which specific containers that users are allowed to deploy, so with a little bit of testing, I think this could be added. Additionally, we only support users deploying to a standard Kubernetes cluster, but I think it would be a lot more interesting if users can deploy cloud-specific services such as Google's App Engine or Amazon's EC2 instances. Uh, for the long-term viability of this project, I think it'd be worthwhile if we pursued a hybrid tenant solution. Currently, users um, all share the same Spinnaker instance and the same Kubernetes provider, but in um, a hybrid tenant model, Users would still share the same Spinnaker instance, but you would provision a separate Kubernetes cluster for each user. This will allow um, users to have less restrictions on what they can deploy, as well as less security concerns as users will only have access to their own cluster and not anyone else's. Before I wrap up my presentation, I would like to give a couple of announcements. So the alpha release for a live hosted version will be released um, very soon. Unfortunately, there was a delay due to infrastructure setup, but the link to the live hosted version will be posted on uh, the CD Foundation Slack and the Spinnaker Slack, so um, keep your eyes out for that. Additionally, we're working on transferring this repo to the Spinnaker organization's GitHub account, and once that's complete, um, I would love to hear your feedback through issues that you can file through GitHub or um, submitting any PRs that you might have. Finally, the single source of truth for this project can be found in the link below. This is a link to the Spinnaker docs, and I will be up updating this site frequently with um, the live link once that shows up and the Slack channel that um, we can use to discuss um, any concerns that you might have about this project or any feedback. I would like to thank the CD Foundation for selecting me as a student for this year and for um, scheduling all the event meetings and things of that nature throughout the summer. I would also like to thank Google for hosting Google Summer of Code this year. And lastly, I would like to give my thanks to my mentors, Dan, Fernando, and Cameron, who've been really helpful um, throughout this entire summer. Thank you for coming to my presentation and feel free to email me or to uh, reach out to me on the CDF Slack channel or the Spinnaker Slack channel. Cloud Events Plugin by Shruti Chaturvedi. Shruti is unable to be with us today, I believe. However, we do have a recording which I'm going to play right now. Hello everyone, my name is Shruti Chaturvedi and in this session we're looking at the Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins and this has been developed as a Google Summer of Code project under CDF. Um, and the idea behind this project or this plugin for Jenkins has been to enhance interoperability between Jenkins and other CI CD tools. How we are doing that is by integrating Jenkins with Cloud Events. So Cloud Events is an industry adopted standard specification for describing how events should look like. So without using Cloud Events, any of the tools, um, there's no common format for how events should be emitted. So 
you know, each of the tools can have their own different and specific way how they are describing events, which makes it very, very hard to design systems or design systems around events or an event driven architecture because there's no common way and each way each way is going to look different for a particular tool. By using cloud events, we're basically standardizing and we're saying that all of the events shouldn't have this particular structure. And thus it makes it very, very easy to define and design event-driven architectures. And we wanted to bring that standard um, specification and that common way of consuming and emitting events inside Jenkins. And that's the cloud events plugin. So um, during phase one demos, we talked quite a bit about indirect interoperability, about cloud events, and why do we want to use this particular idea of interoperability? And here is the link. It's a YouTube video if this is something you'd want to watch. And if you want to read more about interoperability, um, about cloud events, and how is Jenkins interoperating, and how is Jenkins using cloud events, and also why did we want to um, implemented in the first place. Here is a Medium article. So the Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins, it allow users to configure Jenkins as a source and or a sync emitting and consuming Cloud Events. So as we said earlier, using Cloud Events is going to standardize um, the way that events are both emitted and consumed because it is just giving us a, a simple architecture or a simple design of what an event should look like. So with Jenkins as a source, we are defining um, that all of the events which Jenkins will be emitting should be cloud events. And with Jenkins as a sync, we are defining or we are we are defining how Jenkins will be consuming those cloud events. So why would you want to use the cloud events plugin for Jenkins? So obviously the first thing is because it standardizes communication between Jenkins and other CI CD tools. And not just other CI/CD tools, but also tools apart from CI/CD, which is using those cloud events. And this is going to allow indirect interoperability. And and we we talked a bit about interoperability in phase one demos, but to give you an idea about indirect interoperability, is just an idea that we do not want to have a direct one-to-one -one relationship between our systems which are interoperating. So. There is this common language which each of the tool understands, and um, all we are going to do is make our system interoperate with other systems using cloud events or using this common language. Um, the second uh, reason is because we can build complex end-to-end -end pipelines extending multiple CI/CD tools, and again, not just CI/CD, but also other tools which can which uses cloud events without needing any extra efforts. And when I say without needing any extra efforts, what I mean is that we will not need to design um, specific translators to talk with other systems. We will only need this common language. Uh, we, we, which we will be needing in order to design a system which which extends multiple tools and multiple systems. All we will really going to need is for any sync, which is consuming cloud events, to basically um, define how it wants to use a particular kind of event, which is coming from a particular kind of system. So that's that's the logic behind Jenkins as a sync is Jenkins as a sync will understand this common format, which it is going to be consuming from different um, systems, you know, three or four different kind of systems. Um, but the but the logic here is how do we want to use or how do we want to use those particular events which are coming from all of these different systems? Um, the third reason is integrating other system with Jenkins in a loosely coupled, scalable, and tool agnostic manner. Again, this is tool agnostic, so we are not designing this for any particular tool, but this can be extended to any tool which can, con for Jenkins as a source, um, this can be for anything whatever is consuming cloud events. So Jenkins as a source is going to be emitting cloud events and it's just going to be out there. So any of the tool which consumes cloud events can use this particular event which has been emitted from Jenkins. We are not, we are not designing it in a way. So this is going to be 
um, specific to a tool, but this is tool agnostic and scalable in the sense that this can scale to several services, not just two or three, but any service which understands and uses cloud events. Um, and it is obviously loosely coupled because we're not creating that direct one-to-one -one coupling or one-to-one -one agent or adapter, which we will be needing to talk to that particular service. And again, it eliminates the need to maintain tool-specific adapters for communicating with systems. So as you can imagine, it is a much simpler way of communicating. So imagine if we have um, 10 different systems, 10 different uh, systems in our pipeline and each want to talk with each other. And um, it would be quite hectic to define um, it's to define essentially ways to communicate with these 10 different systems because each of these systems would have a different way. But using cloud events, we just have a common length each of these tools is going to understand, is going to emit and consume. So making all of our design very easy. So that's why um, cloud events plugin is your go-to if you're de designing um, such an event driven system. And some super great news is that the Cloud Events plugin is now released. So from phase one, um, the one of the questions that came up was when it's going to be released. Uh, and good news is it's now released and you can check it out uh, right here, download it. And obviously, please do provide us with your feedback. So during phase one demos, we we saw um, Jenkins Cloud Events plugin UI for Jenkins as a source. So how we can configure the Cloud Events plugin for using um, Jenkins as a source, which is going to be emitting cloud events and other systems can consume these events. We also saw the types of events which are supported by Jenkins Cloud Events plugin. Um, so going back down here, we have queue events, we have build events, we have job events and also node offline and online events. Um, another thing we saw was the structure. So how the metadata of the event can look like and how the event data can look like. And we saw this using Sockeye service, which is a K-native uh, serving service and going to define how each of these events is going to look like. So with phase two starting, we had some questions for ourselves. And these questions made us think more broadly about the Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins, um, not just in an individual sense, but also how this is going to look like for when Jenkins is interoperating with many different uh, CI CD tools. And when a user is building a pipeline which has different CI CD tools which need to interoperate. So the first question we had was, how can we implement a transient fault tolerant way of sending cloud events, um, especially important for an event driven architecture, because we want to make sure that none of the event is um, is lost by any network failures. And how can the plugin handle asynchronous communication? So very important for implementing an event driven architecture through um, the cloud events plugin for Jenkins inside of Jenkins. Um, the second question was, if we were to implement a, a, an asynchronous communication inside of the Jenkins, how, how should we do that? Should we have a messaging queue system or a pop sub system? Um, the third question was, how can this plugin work alongside other CI CD tools um, that use Cloud Events? So again, very important to make sure that the Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins allows Jenkins to achieve that initial goal of enhancing interoperability between different systems in a much easier way and without needing to maintain specific adapters for each different system. Um, so we wanted to see if our final goal of building a tool agnostic and a scalable eventing system for Jenkins has been achieved through the Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins. Um, so all of these questions led us into designing a proof of concept uh, using Jenkins Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins and also a tools which have been using um, Cloud Events. Uh, specifically CIT tools. And this proof of concept has been inspired by the event SIG team at CD um, Foundation. And so they have something very similar with Tecton and Captain, where both of these systems act as a source in the same sending and consuming cloud events and how they are implementing that, um, that fault tolerant and also the asynchronous communication is through Knative Cloud Events Broker. And Cloud Events Knative Broker by default uses cloud events and transfers it between different systems. So it acts as that middleware handling asynchronous communication, handling all um, retries and 
other never failures which might occur. So it is taken away from both like Tacton and Captain and in our POC that um, handling of network failures is taken away from the CloudWinds plugin and it is it's sort of creating an abstraction at the CloudWinds um, Knative broker layer rather than inside of our plugin. So, so what do we have inside of the Jenkins POC for Cloud Events plugin is Jenkins as a source and then Cloud Events and Tecton as a sync consuming Cloud Events. So we also tested this out with Captain um, and also did, did a test with how this is going to look like for when we are using Kafka. Um, but in this particular POC, we're only looking at Jenkins and Tecton, where Jenkins is sending a cloud events broker to a Knative cloud events um, broker. So the Knative cloud events broker has an idea of a Knative trigger. And a Knative trigger, you can think of it as a filter, which filters on specific attributes of the cloud events um, metadata. For example, CE type. So looking here, we have CE type, CE spec, ID, and source. So we can specify any of that inside of our um, Knative trigger and only any event which has that attribute matching will be passed on further and all of the other events will um, not go beyond that layer. Uh, so any of the events which pass the Knative trigger will all will move on to a Tecton trigger and the Tecton trigger is will be receiving the cloud events and this is where we can extract you know event specific information from um, cloud events. So for example you know if we have we can extract um, number of executors or we can also extract event data or event metadata however we however we like and pass that information and trigger a task run or pipeline run however we have defined it inside of tecton definition so now we will be moving on into the demonstration and taking a brief look at the yaml files we find for the poc all right so what we're looking here are brokers in the Knative eventing namespace so we have two different kinds we have the default broker and the kafka broker and the default broker is a very simple cloud events um, broker which is going to be dealing with cloud events um, events to transfer messages between subscribers and different um, syncs and sources essentially so the default broker is the only one we will be, we'll be talking about in this poc this is a broker definition a very simple a default broker and this is the trigger so as we were looking at the image for our poc the knative trigger is going to define a filter and it is going to filter events on that specific attribute that we have defined so the event attribute that which we have defined here is type or c type because we are referring it to type because it is going to be c type or cloud event specific attribute so ce type to be um q and thread waiting so here is the event that we are looking at, and this is the only event which will be passed through to the subscriber of the um, of this Knative broker. So Tecton, this is the only Q and head waiting is the only one which will pass through. And the next thing that we have is Tecton trigger, and the Tecton trigger is what is going to be receiving that entire event and then extract information. So here is where we are extracting information, job name from the CE type. Um, and then this is the information that we can use in our task run and our pipeline run, however we want to um, use this information. And this is not only specific to uh, event metadata, we can also use event data. Um, again, this is according to the need of a user. So where are you open to using however you would want to use this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this particular URL, and this is going to be the URL for um, sync of the cloud events broker or the cloud events um, plugin for Jenkins right here. So I'm going to paste this. And when I paste this, all of the events of the, the, the types which are checked here will be sent over to the sync. Um, but whatever will be sent from the broker to Tecton will be that one event which we are filtering, which is the queue entered waiting this particular event. So I'm going to save this information. And what we're here is we're looking at um, task runs inside of Tecton dashboard. So when I run this job, I should see one single task run, um, not two, not three. Uh, so we're looking at this test, and this is the one I will be triggering here. And it will only trigger as soon as that event is received inside of Knative Cloud Events Worker that is going to be filtered. And this is going to be sent over to Tecton. And Tecton will trigger a task run if a particular event of that type is received. So for now, we're only seeing one event, and that's good. Jenkins to Tecton task run. And this is what um, we have defined. So, so yeah, so this is the only 
event that was uh, that was received by Tecton because all other events were filtered. And if, for example, there had to be if my Tecton was not available, um, or for some reason there were some other network failures, it would be the job of Knative Eventing um, broker or the Knative Cloud Events broker, which handles cloud events. And this is going to be um, retrying all of those network and transient failures. So that was it for the demonstration of the POC. So that was the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. A uh, special thank you and shout out to the CD Foundation, um, GSOC, and all mentors on this project for such an amazing summer. Um, this might be an end of GSOC, but this is definitely not the end of um, me contributing to and being a member of an absolutely amazing community. Um, and if you have any questions and feedback, we would all love to hear them. You can send me an email here, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or our GitHub repository, and please file an issue with us. And we would love to take this further and develop this into a more um, robust system. Thank you. Great. Um, so I want to thank Shruti for sending in this uh, recording. Um, do we have uh, comments or uh, questions from uh, I would have one, please. So my name is Cyril and I was a mentor on the Open Telemetry uh, implementation of Jenkins Remote. And I would be interested in understanding what are the semantic conventions that are used in the event. We can communicate events, we have a shared data structure, but what are the what is the common language, the common attributes that are shared across all these CI CD tools so that they can interoperate together? This would be something interesting to me. Uh, all right. Um, so Shruti is not on the call. Like, I, I guess those were comments, right, uh, Cyril? Yes, it was something I would be interested in understanding, I think. Uh, and I've seen the CD Foundation has done some work to normalize the vocabulary across CI tools. So I guess it relates together. But that can be taken up. Right? We, we may want to have Serial connect with uh, the interop the interoperability SIG at CDF to get more details on the cloud events plug uh, cloud events uh, semantics. I think it's a it's an excellent question. I'm just not sure that the group here has answers for it. Well, I do have uh, only basic answers, but we can follow up later or oh, on the call. Uh, but actually, uh, cloud events is very pluggable. It's structured event system, so you can uh, add a lot of information in uh, these messages. Basically, integrate as many systems as you need. And uh, yeah, one thing which was mentioning that cloud events basically doesn't mean that events themselves are very much standardized. So that's why uh, there is a project started in the Continuous Delivery Foundation about creating a standard for CI events. So there is a separate project started uh, basically as a spin-off uh, of the events SIG. So there is interoperability SIG. The interoperability SIG um, uh, created another special interest group in the CDF called events special interest group. And this events SIG is actually working on an open standard that would uh, unify these events across multiple systems. So a great time to contribute. It's very important to, to be able to integrate things together. And if we can imagine some Grafana dashboards, things like this, if we have some uh, common semantic conventions, then as a community, we'll be able to create a lot of tools that will integrate with all CI systems. And we need a more that was like an accent. Okay, um, thanks. I'd like to move on to the next presentation if there's no other comments or questions. Okay, I will start my share again.
The next, oops. The next presentation is Security Validator for Jenkins Kubernetes Operator. This is a presentation is by Pulkit Sharma. And for this one, I will play the recording as well. Hi everyone, I'm Bulgit and today I'm going to demonstrate my work uh, on adding a security validator to the Jenkins Kubernetes operator. Uh, so uh, the security validator, right? So uh, uh, like what is the problem it is solving, right? So uh, in the Jenkins custom resource that uh, we are defining, uh, uh, we are defining it in a declarative manner right so the the custom resources and the plugins are uh, being de declared in this fashion right so uh, there are some security vulnerabilities that are present in the plugins and uh, it is not uh, uh, visible to the end user so uh, to solve this problem uh, like the security validator is being added to the operator so the security validator is nothing but a validation webhook that uh, that operates before the object is persisted to the HCD cluster, right? So it uh, operates before creating or updating a Kubernetes uh, Jenkins custom resource object, right? So uh, the webhook uh, is different from the validation that we are do doing in the reconciliation loop. Uh, it is after uh, the object is persisted to that 3d cluster so it is slow in contrast to the you know, that validation the webhook is quite fast and uh, yeah so on using the webhook it is completely uh, optional for the user to use the webhook right and it can be easily installed via help or there are cube cuttle manifests uh, that can be used to uh, get the webhook up and running right also uh, we are using a uh, cert manager as an external dependency right because we have to manage tls certificates and uh, that's why cert manager uh, is used so uh, uh, let us move for, to the demonstration right for demonstration so uh, I'll be using the uh, image that I have built locally to launch the operator along with the webhook. So uh, this is the image that I have built locally. So this Jenkins operator security validator. Uh, first of all, uh, let me create a new namespace. Uh, name it demo. And then uh, I'll be using Helm charts to uh, get the operator up and running. Right. So. Uh, will provide the path to the charts yeah. so the namespace uh, we have to specify the namespace so the namespace for the operator and then i am going to uh, set the image that i am going to use right so this is the image Also, the webhook is completely optional and we can have it up and running you, uh, via this webhook.enable tag, right? So, by setting it to true, uh, the webhook can uh, be installed, right? So, uh, this tag will also in install all the external dependencies like the cert manager and all those depend dependencies will also be installed uh, when we will enable the webhook, right? So also it is uh, advisable to not to launch the jenkins cr along with this helm charts because uh, the webhook actually takes some time to get up and running and if uh, uh, i install the jenkins custom resource along with the webhook then uh, uh, i won't be able to validate the security warning so uh, by default it is uh, set to be true right so uh, by default we are launching the Jenkins custom resource so we should set it to false as well so yeah that's it I think uh, I have specified all the uh, 
uh, flags so let's launch the operator yeah so it's up so let us see so yeah yeah so uh, actually it takes some time for the operator to get up and running right so uh, it will first initialize the plugin data cache and all those things so it uh, generally takes around a minute or two uh, to get the operator up and running and then uh, we can launch the Jenkins here right so so uh, all the cert manager resources and all those resources will take some time to get up and running and uh, they will provide the TLS certificates necess necessary for the communication so uh, yeah i think all the resources are up so, so finally the operator will start so as you can see it takes some time time for the search manager resources to get uh, so that is why the operator was uh, the pod was crashing initially so okay so now the operator is up and running so let us try to create a jenkins uh, custom resource from here right so uh, i have defined some jenkins custom resources and uh, in the first example uh, i am uh, creating a cr uh, with some of the plugins containing security vulnerabilities for example in this vnc viewer plugin uh, we are using the 1.7 version right so uh, this version will have security vulnerabilities right so uh, let us try to create a new cr from here so yeah so it will throw an error uh, specifying the uh, plugins containing security vulnerabilities for example uh, it will sp uh, like specify that these user defined plugins uh, will have security vulnerabilities and uh, we have these four plugins that have security vulnerabilities right so uh, in the upcoming example uh, i have kept all of the plugins uh, right so i have updated their versions uh, to uh, a version which does not have security vulnerabilities right so uh, let us uh, try to create a uh, new cr from here but first of all uh, let us uh, let me see the logs of the operator right so uh, uh, yeah so Yeah, so as you can see uh, there there are a lot of warnings in the log right so it is like for each version of the plugin uh, there will be multiple security vulnerabilities right so uh, in the logs uh, we can uh, like we can see the all the security vulnerabilities detected for that particular version also we can see the warning message and the link to the uh, advisory right so uh, there is a whole a lot of metadata that uh, is included in the logs right so 
let us try to create a new Jenkins CR right so this time we should be able to succeed yeah so it works so now let us see the logs yeah so it wrote a response that allowed is like we are allowing on it to create a object right so it sends a 200 response right so yeah that's uh, pretty much it apart from that uh, uh, we have to mention that uh, whether we want to validate the security warnings or not and if we set this flag to false so for example in this uh, particular example if we set it to false so here uh, we have plugins containing security vulnerabilities and if we set this to false then uh, it should fail to create the Jenkins CR right so uh, let us try so uh, yeah so it is able to create the Jenkins CR despite having uh, despite the plugins having security vulnerabilities so we can uh, yeah so we can uh, manipulate it whether we want to detect vulnerabilities or not using this toggle switch so uh, that's all uh, so there is always room for improvement right so uh, some of the areas uh, on which uh, we can like extend the project or add some features is like one of them is to uh, have a post install hook right so uh, as you have seen while uh, installing the webhook right so it uh, takes term some time to get ready so uh, what can be done is to have a post install hook that uh, checks whether uh, the webhook is uh, ready and when it is ready then uh, the helm installation will be completed so the user knows that the uh, uh, now he can send like he can create a Jenkins custom resource uh, another uh, things uh, another areas uh, on which uh, uh, the webhook can be extended is uh, we can move the validation logic uh, that is being done in the controller to the webhook right and uh, there is other sorts of uh, validation that uh, logic that can be uh, implemented in the webhook right uh, one uh, another feature is uh, 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 like we right now we are uh, validating the plugins right so uh, for each plugin uh, there is uh, there are dependencies for uh, a particular plugin right so uh, what can be done is uh, we can like traverse the whole dependency graph and check for uh, validate all those plugins all its depend dependencies as well because uh, uh, that is uh, uh, those are those plugins are also being installed so uh, uh, like validating uh, uh, those before installation uh, would make sense right so uh, this is another uh, cool feature that can be implemented so yeah so that's all from my side thanks Thank you, Pulkit, for this uh, presentation. I will stop the share and uh, open the floor for questions and comments. Do we have questions or comments uh, regarding uh, uh, Pulkit's presentation? Okay, going once, going twice. Let's move on to our last presentation today. Oops, okay. Our last presentation is Jenkins Remote Monitoring by Akihiro Kyuchi. And I believe Akihiro is here. So do you want to uh, share your screen? Akihiro. We're not hearing any sound from you, Akihiro. I can see, I can see it looks like you're speaking, but I'm not hearing any sound.
about this? Yes, Good. yes. Okay, thanks so much. I, I want to share my screen. Yes, go ahead. Yes, oh, thank you. So can, I begin, yes? Yes, we can see your screen. You can okay. go ahead. Thank you so much. I, I'll talk about my project, uh, Remoting Motoring with Open Telemetry and uh, Makihiro Kiuchi. And the purpose of this project is to support Jenkins admins in troubleshooting and monitoring the remoting system. And to achieve this purpose, uh, we set the goals below. Uh, one is to collect telemetry data, including uh, metrics, traces, and logs of the remoting module with open telemetry. And the other is to set to send the data to an open telemetry protocol endpoint. And the open telemetry is a next standard, next industry standard observability framework for cloud native software. Uh, and, and it handles uh, three type of telemetry data, logs, metrics, and traces at once, and thereby uh, it enables the integration between the different type of telemetry data. And, but in this Google Swamp code, uh, I didn't include the trace feature uh, and I'll explain the details later. Yes. And, and which open telemetry endpoint to use or how to visualize the data uh, are up to users and users need to uh, set up these services on their own. I'll show you a demo first. Okay. And I will follow the getting started section in the readme of this project. And I've already cloned the repository in this demo. And now change directory to the example directory and run Docker containers uh, using Docker Compose. And this will set up an uh, open telemetry collector and uh, which is an open telemetry protocol endpoint and Rocky for log aggregation and Prometheus for metrics backend and Grafana for log and metrics visualization. And in this demo, uh, I will also set up a Jenkins controller using Docker Compose. Yes, and next uh, I will download a monitoring engine uh, from Jenkins Marvin repository. Uh, this engine is a Java, file format, Java format file, and this engine is the main deliverable of this project. And I will use the engine rater as a Java agent when launching agents. Okay, and when you want to correct uh, logs of remoting, uh, you need to create a logging property file and use our log handler. So I will create the logging property file and copy this configuration file. Yes. And here you need to set our uh, logging handler here. Okay. So, so by now, uh, all Docker containers are running and the monitoring engine has been downloaded. And then I will run a Jenkins agent. And first I will download the remoting, uh, remoting agent from here. Yes, agent, uh, okay. And set, the, set this environment variables. Uh, this specifies the location of the target open telemetry protocol. Uh, then I will execute, execute the remoting agent. And here you need to use uh, the remoting engine as a Java agent. This uh, use remoting engine as a Java agent. And you need to also specify the logging property file. And then agent is connected. And let's explore, explore the telemetry data on Grafana. Okay, first I will show you the agent logs from the Loki data source. Uh, here you can filter the agent logs by service instance ID. And the monitoring engine generate this service instance ID 
uh, for each agent automatically. But uh, also you can set this value, set this service instance ID uh, using an environment variables. Uh, now you can see the logs in Graf on Grafana. Okay. And each log entry has several attributes such as log levels and, and the names of the class and the names of, name of the class and method uh, that issue the log. And next, uh, oh, oh. and uh, regarding the logs, uh, in, in the error log, you can see the stack trace for the error. Okay, and next, uh, I will show the agent metrics from Promises uh, data source. Uh, you can filter the metrics by metrics type and the service instance ID or other uh, attributes. And yes, so far, uh, we collect only very general metrics like CPU load, JVM, JVM memory usage, and et cetera, like, like this. But uh, in the future, I want to add more Jenkins specific metrics such as the number of reconnection or the size of the working directory or et cetera. Yeah. Yes, and I will introduce other features and deliverables. First, uh, you can control which metrics to correct. Uh, in, in, this, uh, in this monitoring engine, uh, you, uh, this monitoring engine can correct many kinds of metrics, but you may want to correct only GVM metrics because you already correct the other kinds of metrics with another tool. So we offer the feature to filter the metrics by their name using regular expression. So you can correct only GVM metrics by setting uh, environment variable like this. And I prepare two types of demos uh, so that you can try them out very quickly. One, one uses Docker Compose like the demo I showed before, and, and the other uses Kubernetes. Docker Compose demo is the, easiest, is the easiest way to try out our monitoring engine. It set up all services you need and its services, its service is pre-configured. So what you need to do is to clone our repository and change the directory to the example directory and do Docker Compose app. And then you can explore the data on the Grafana. And I also prepared the Kubernetes plugin integration demo. And, and in this demo, the service instance ID will be its node name, so you can find out target logs and metrics more quickly. And I will show you a quick demo for this Kubernetes demo. Okay, I will set up a mini cube cluster. Gotta skip. Okay, and create a namespace Jenkins. and set up pods. And I will create a Jenkins controller and a Rocky and uh, open telemetry collector and promises and Grafana. So then I will skip until all pods to be created. Okay. And then I will access the Jenkins controller and set up Kubernetes plugin. Yeah, I'll skip. Yes. Okay, I will set Kubernetes URL and test connection, and it's successfully connected to the Kubernetes cluster. And next, I will create a sample pipeline. Yes, name sample pipeline. And I will use our custom agent image in this demo. And 
I will copy in a pipeline script. Yes, and I will use a custom image. And the image and its Docker file are published on GitHub. And this pipeline, uh, waiting for me, uh, I'll back. So this, this, this pipeline just print hello and sleeps 300 seconds. And I will start this pipeline twice. And here, uh, two agents are correct allocated, and these agents uh, emit the telemetry data. So let's see Grafana. Okay, I'll show you a log, and you can filter the log by service instance ID, and its value is equal to the agent Jenkins node name. So you can use these strings to filter the logs. So it's much more easy to access to the logs. And you can also see the, see the uh, metrics from Prometheus data source. Well, it's like this. Okay, I will, next, I will go to the next slide. And in the end, I will mention my backlog. And the biggest backlog is the tracing feature. I try two approaches in to I try two approaches to trace remoting behavior. One is to use engine listener, engine listener interface, and the other is to create extension points on remoting to trace the remoting more precisely. And I tried to generate a variable spans and I tried to define a variable spans for monitoring and troubleshooting the remoting system in the phase one. And, I, and as you can see in this figure, I actually created a system to trace, to, to trace monitoring behavior as a proof of concept. But finally, I couldn't find out a good way to instrument remoting module to produce variable and helpful tracing data for monitoring and travel for monitoring and troubleshooting. So I decided not to include the tracing feature in the Google Smart Code deliverable. And I I mentioned the other another other backlogs. Uh, in the current implementation, uh, we collect only very general metrics like CP road. But we can help Jenkins admins more by adding more Jenkins specific metrics. For example, the count of reconnection or the average offline time in a day may help Jenkins admins to check the connectivity. And I conducted a user survey in phase one and I found that uh, connectivity is one of the main uh, factor for a high availability agents. So, so this is important. And Users should be able to configure the open telemetry service name and service namespace and remoting at resource attributes. So having more configure having more configuration option is also the backlog of this backlog of this project. Yes, uh, this is all for my presentation. And uh, Google Sum of Gold in Jenkins is a great experience for me. And thank you so much, mentors. And anyone involved to uh, organize this Google Sum of Gold. Thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation, Nakihiro. Um, are there any questions or comments? I would like to just uh, say thank you to Akihiro uh, for all the contributions because yeah, it's a great project, uh, which is super valuable to, to the Jenkins ecosystem. And you can see that uh, there is so many projects happening around the observability space and the agent monitoring has been always a big issue for Jenkins and users. So currently with uh, this update, uh, we will be able to provide better diagnostics uh, for users. And I'm looking forward to adopting in the in CI Jenkins IO as well, because today we would definitely benefit from some advanced monitoring features. So thanks so much. Thanks a lot. And yeah, thanks. Yeah. From, yeah. I'm super happy about the project results.
and hopefully we will be able to continue with other open telemetry types. So basically to clean up this backlog because there is a lot of opportunities. So yes. Maybe it's a subject for either another mentorship program or so maybe Google Summer of Code next year. So personally, mm -hmm. I would rather prefer to work on it earlier. Let's see. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, can you please, uh, I think I can override your share. So I'll stop your oh, sharing, okay. Akira. Yeah, okay, thanks for those uh, the presentation and those comments. Is there any other comments or questions? Actually, uh, uh, like I had power cut, so I had to drop off that. So, I, so if there are any uh, questions uh, that the audience would like to ask, I am happy to answer them now. So, yes. So, are there any questions for uh, regarding security validator? Uh, for me, maybe one of the questions would be about um, uh, classic Jenkins Helm charts. So have you discussed together with mentors whether some bits of this project could be also applied there? Or is it solely specific to the Jenkins Kubernetes separator at the moment? Oh. Can you repeat your question, please? So, okay, sorry. In addition for the Jen to the Jenkins Kubernetes operator, uh, the results uh, uh, classic Jenkins Helm charts. And uh, also there is a lot of uh, security related questions there in terms of management uh, and configuration, including YAML files. So I wonder whether the results of your projects could be potentially applied to there too. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Looks like we have a connectivity issues, Oleg, with a pull kit. I He dropped mm -hmm. off the call. And maybe I will, will ask in the chat. And by the way, all projects have a chat, so you can just ask the, as needed. Oh, he's back. You want to try to answer that pull kit if you heard the question? Yeah. I feel like the network is quite unstable, so that's why. Okay. Uh, yeah, so okay. uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yeah, yeah. So uh, regarding your question, what I'm uh, like, what I have understood is like, uh, you, know, you are uh, saying that uh, the Helm charts, like, uh, we can uh, use the Helm charts to uh, install the operator, and uh, we can uh, like apply uh, those results, right? So. Uh, the Helm installation and the time uh, to get uh, the operator uh, to be ready. So uh, you are saying that uh, uh, like, uh, can we uh, like uh, have uh, use Helm charts for installation, right? So hello. Uh, yes, though it's uh, not about uh, using Helm chart for the operator installation. This part is clear. It's rather about using uh, the same validators for Jenkins being installed with Helm chart, but without operator. Because uh, the results are official Jenkins Helm chart, which is not based on operator, uh, it's standalone. All right. So uh, may I suggest uh, the, uh, you can continue yeah, uh, no, in the chat? It's, it yeah. will be better. Yes. Okay. So, th thank you, Paul Kit, for, uh, for for this, for 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 the time and uh, for answering questions. They could continue answering questions in the chat. I believe that will be easier. Okay. Let's move on to the conclusion. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Let's move on to. Uh, concluding the presentations today. So last couple of slides. All right, so 
just want to thank everyone again. We have a feedback form that I invite uh, everyone to uh, visit and give us feedback um, regarding the Summer of Code program and this presentation. And actually, this is the end, so we'll turn off the recording and, and, and then everybody can ask uh, more question, uh, questions in a more open channel and speak freely uh, to each other. All right. And it's actually the last slide. So thanks, everyone. Let me stop the recording.